Welcome everyone to Windwire's Purpose Driven Virtual Fireside Chat. We are thrilled to have you join us for our 28th episode. Whether this is your first time attending or a dedicated follower, welcome and thank you for being here. Our goal throughout this series is to feature thought leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators, and executives alike who have made purpose their mission. They do this by integrating innovative software solutions, leadership, and social good into the thread of the organizations. I'm Bianca Beatty, your moderator for today's Fireside Chat. Our topic for today's episode is creating purposeful connections through our open ecosystems. Our chat will run until approximately 1230, and at that time, we'll open the floor for our live Q&A session. Without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to our host, Aushu Goel, the CEO of Windwire, who will be interviewing our expert guest panelists, Arun Gupta, the Vice President and General Manager of Open Ecosystems at Intel. Welcome, Aushu and Arun. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you for uh, for uh, welcoming us. And Arun, uh, pleasure to get connected with you and welcome to our fireside chat. Thank, Thank you for joining us. So happy to be here. Great, great. Um, before we get started, folks, uh, I know many of you listen to us on a very regular basis, but folks who are joining us new, uh, my name is Ashu Goel. I'm the CEO of Winwire. We are an IT services and solutions provider, focuses on unleashing the power of Azure and generative AI. Um, we really focus on enabling enterprises to gain competitive advantage through innovative software solutions, work very, very closely with Microsoft, uh, and we build this on our core foundation values of people first, technology leadership, and execution excellence. Um, this is one, uh, you know, some a topic that's pretty close to my heart. And I've been very fortunate to be associated with a lot of leaders in the industry and the organizations that I work with on really seeing how purpose and profit can coexist in an organization, which we call purpose-driven innovation. Um, I think it's very well proven now, uh, and I'm sure uh, Arun is going to talk more about it, is that it's no longer one or the other. I think every organization has to take a look at um, how do they drive profit, but also how to be very purposeful, uh, how to inspire uh, that uh, confidence in their in their stakeholders to do something more than what's possible on, on just a regular basis. And, and I think it is really focused around sort of core values um, and, and driven around this mission of making world a better place. And, and we are seeing most successful organizations right now are more and more aligned to that. Um, I know we have a variety of different listeners of, uh, you know, some are young, some uh, some are senior leaders, some are aspiring to be to be leaders. And, and so my goal is by end of this, you'll be able to learn from around multiple things around, uh, you know, what drove him to where he, are, he, he is, uh, what um, has he observed, what are his beliefs, what are his observations around the industry. And hopefully you'll walk away with a bunch of things that you can do, looking at how to drive purpose either in your team or in your organization. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to our guest speaker today, Arun Gupta. Arun is Vice President and General Manager of Open Ecosystem Initiatives at Intel. Uh, he's an open source strategist, advocate, and practitioner uh, for over two decades. He has taken companies such as Apple, Amazon, and Sun Microsystem through systemic change to embrace open source principles, contribute, and col collaborate effectively. Uh, as an elected chair of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, governing board, Arun works with CNCF leadership and member companies to grow cloud native ecosystem. He's the elected governing board chair of the Open Source Security Foundation, focused on securing the open source software ecosystem, which we know how important it is. He also participates on the Linux Foundation governing board. He has delivered technical talks in 45 plus countries, authored multiple books, and is a Docker captain, Java champion, and Java user group leader. He's a fitness and kindness enthusiast. I'm sure you guys will hear more about it. Uh, practices mindfulness and is passionate about promoting technology education among children. Welcome, Arun. Delighted to have you over here. Thank you very much for taking the time. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about what purpose-driven innovation means to you and how do you take a look at it. Yeah, Ashu, thank you for having me here. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I was listening to your introduction 
and the point I noted was people first technology leadership. I think that is fundamental. Um, a lot of the times we get distracted by, oh, what is it that is driving our revenues? You know, and we lose the sight of the forest for a tree. And that to me is really where companies miss the mark a lot of the times. You got to have a very, very clear purpose, uh, a mission statement, which is sort of the core of what drives that purpose. So let me take an example of Intel, for example. Our purpose is we create world-changing technology that improves the life of every person on the planet. With that as a mission, is profit important? Absolutely, it's a commercial company. We got to make money, we got to grow. All of that is important. But if we keep that as the fundamental purpose of the company, then no matter what silicon we are providing, where we are installing silicon, that becomes sort of your north guiding star. Are we improving the life of people on the planet? Are we making sure it's easier for our customers to deploy their applications a lot more easily? Are we giving them a choice? Are we making them a partner? Are we locking them into a closed ecosystem versus open ecosystem where they could be really our partners and derive the solution for us? So I think that really becomes fundamental to what the purpose-driven um, leadership really mean. And it really drives from the very top, having that very clear purpose. What are the values? So for example, one of Intel's values is customer first. No matter what you do, if your customer is not part of the journey, if you are not working to solve customer problems, nobody cares, right? right. Because that end of the day, we could create whatever hardware, but if that hardware is not solving their problem in their environment, we are not really creating a purpose here. So th those are the kind of things that are fundamental. And also having that long-term perspective that, sure, can I have a short-term financial gain, but how does that align with my long-term perspective? How are my employees engaged in all of these? You know, am I inspiring my employees? Am I engaging them so that they are connecting to the larger purpose of the organization? So I think, <laughs> Those are some of the points when I think about purpose-driven leadership. It really go beyond financial success and creating like a positive impact on the world. Um, and really that wonderful culture for the employees. So they, they feel motivated, they're happy, they're excited, they're driven, they're on fire to fulfill that purpose. Then nothing can stop from the financial gains. Very true. Very well said. Uh, I completely agree with you, uh, Arun. Uh, one very interesting thing, uh, especially uh, very unique in your scenario, you've been a champion of open ecosystem for a very long time. And now it's very well sort of established way of doing business. But that wasn't the case in the early days. People were struggling between that ecosystem, uh, openness, purpose, and how do you drive profit out of it? How do you look at it? Um, how did you deal with that? And how did you um, figure out business models and creative ways and, and got teams along? Because I'm assuming that must have been a very interesting and, uh, and a challenging sort of uh, thought process to go through. Yeah, absolutely. Well, b back in 2003, yeah, well, actually about two decades ago, is when we decided, like as in the CEO of Sun at that point, that we're going to take the company open source and parts and pieces of it. So Solaris, Java, all those pieces. I was particularly in the Java team and open source was known at that point, but there were no credible business models. Red Hat was in its early days around that time. And it was the only open source company people knew. There were not a lot of open source business models around it. So at that point, really the idea was our at Sun, hardware is the primary money maker, but open source allows our customers to test out our hardware in an easy manner because then our customers are continuing to work with us in open source, defining that software. And then it's basically, how are you enabling your hardware sales? 
So one of the key ways to think about this is if you define the, if you drive the mind share, the market share comes to you. And that's sort of the basic premise. If you think about of open ecosystem is right, you know, you are enabling your customers to be successful. You are in it on the journey. You continue to guide them, continue to make them successful. And then end of the day, if they are building the solution on your hardware, at some point of time, they will say, all right, I'm ready to go production. Because at that point, if the customers are going into production, that means they're going to make money out of it. At that point, the customers don't mind paying the money as opposed to the closed ecosystem where you say, oh, the only way you can try this is it's a time bound, a limited version of it. And the customers don't get the full flavor of it. So in that sense, back 20 years ago is how we changed the game. And it was not just technology, it's people, it's process, it's tools, it's technology, the entire deal. I remember having water cooler conversations and saying, sure, three of us talked about it, that this is what makes sense from the architecture perspective. How are we going to share it with the rest of the world if they want to be participatory over there? So really building that open source culture became very inherent as part of the process. And that creates diversity because other people feel enabled that they can participate in the discussion. That creates inclusion that, okay, I can actually be participating in the discussion and it will be respected because there are no siloed discussions happening. So fundamental shift in the company, but that's sort of where we started creating those business models. And then over the years, like I worked at Amazon and Apple and created their open source strategies. At Amazon, I was on loan to different service teams crafting their open source strategy. And each service team had a very different strategy. Like when we launched Amazon EKS, at that point, it was very clear that we just want to provide a managed service around Kubernetes, straying truly compatible with upstream Kubernetes. And that worked out really well. On the other side, we created Firecracker. And Firecracker is the underlying backend of AWS Lambda. And the strategy was a bit different over there. We're going to launch a new open source project, build community around it, and not give it to a foundation. So again, the point being, there is no one right answer. It really looking at the nuances, looking at what's the main purpose, that why are you open sourcing? Even at Intel now, like teams come to me, I don't want to open sources. My first question is why? What is the purpose? What are you trying to get out of it? Are you looking for adoption? Are you looking for more community support? Are you trying to engage customers into it, partners into it? Um, vendors into it what is the purpose and if that is the purpose are you ready to invest into that open source project to drive that purpose because throwing source code over the firewall is not enough you got to invest into it from the community perspective somebody's going to send a pull request how are you going to manage that pull request how are you going to make sure you're nurturing that community so all of that kind of becomes sort of the purpose of your project mm, very interesting yeah, because I'm always fascinated. Uh, you know, early early on, nobody knew. People were wondering oh, if you're gonna open source this, are you gonna make money? And that all changed, I think, over a period of time. Great. Yeah, and, and just to elaborate a little bit more on that, usually when you will do open source, um, the standard way is that you will make money. There are lots of different ways you do, but usual way is you could have an open core model where you can yeah. just put the open core, then you have a commercial product, or you could say. Here is a product that is out in the open source, which is time bomb, you know, four users. But if you go 20 users, we're going to charge you money. Or you could say, here is an open source project. We have a managed service of it because customers don't want to go into the operational aspect of it. So lots of different ways. There are commercialization opportunities um, that are available. And again, no one right answer. It depends upon when you are launching the, per the project, what is the purpose and how you want to scale it. And maybe when you choose a model at that point of time, that may be the right model, but the market shifts dramatically. Right. And right. then how do you pivot? How do you go to that new model is again a critical element. Absolutely. No, I think I think uh, very well said. Um, Arun, just building on top of it, um, as, as you're building it, how do you how do you foster a culture of innovation within your team? And in what ways do you believe sort of a purpose-driven leadership contributes to both sort of the short-term goals 
and long-term vision. And maybe you can tie it to sort of what's, what you're doing at Intel's um, open ecosystem strategy or broad base it, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if I think about <clears throat> what is our vision of the open ecosystem team at Intel, really the way we see this is how do we embrace open ecosystem as a force multiplier to accelerate Intel's industry leadership? And let me kind of break that apart. What that means is open ecosystem is happening everywhere around the world. Open JDK, Kubernetes, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Cassandra, Kafka, and these are massive projects at high scale. And our customers care about it. Um, so our customers, whether they are spinning up an instance in AWS or Azure or Google, or they're spinning up a network or an edge device, or they're buying a laptop from Best Buy, as they're trying to build these applications using these open source frameworks, they want to make we want to make sure that when they run OpenJDK commercial distribution on it, it runs out of the box. It runs, it is able to leverage the latest hardware that they're buying the laptop for so that they get the best performance. And that's sort of the biggest purpose we look at it. How do we tie ourselves to make it work for customers? That's the Intel core value, customer first mindset. So when we look at that as the mindset, that's sort of what drives us to, there are 19,000 software engineers at Intel. That's what drives us to continue driving contributions to upstream because it's directly tied to the business value. So a very clear purpose, but directly tied to the business value. And that's sort of where I mean by breaking, how do we embrace open ecosystem as a force multiplier for us to accelerate our leadership? So it's important, <coughs> excuse me, it's important to have that purpose, but really kind of tie it back to the business value as well, kind of keeps it hand in hand and keeps it in check. And that honestly is one of my pet peeves for Sun. Like with Sun, we did everything for the goodness with very lack of clarity of business model. And that's the reason Sun went down. And I'm really glad I'm at Intel now because there's a very clear tie in to the purpose and how it drives business value for us. So that balance that you're talking about is critical. And the way we believe is open ecosystem creates a leveled playground where customers do the innovation. So we provide the basic building blocks and Intel is a hardware company, but we provide optimizations throughout the stack and that allows customers to innovate on top of that. Yeah, no, I, I think um, that was a very good example of Sun. I didn't think of it that way, but it is a balance of purpose and profit, uh, right? And in any one area you put more into uh, there is an imbalance at that stage and it can it can spiral out of control or down, which happened in the case of Sun. Correct. Great technology, great ideas, just not tying it to the right business model or with the changing times. Um, network is the computer was the, you know, is the first thing and um, look at where we are now, which is the reality, but, but the original statement maker is no longer. Um... Yeah, I mean, like, I remember sitting <clears throat> at the Cupertino campus of Sun back, gosh, in 98. Um, and I saw that a big poster in the Cupertino building saying, we are the dot in dot com. I said, oh, that is freaking cool. I love that tagline and I want to be part of that company. And back in what, 2003, four, we used to have SunGrid, which was, you know, network is the only computer and Amazon did not start until 2000, AWS did not start until 2006. So we had that concept. We had those things, a dollar an hour execution plan lined up. The purpose was there, but it was not tied to the business and it just collapsed. I think exactly. to date, it still breaks my heart that Sun did not become a successful company, but there is a very valuable lesson learned though. Yeah, I mean, and look at the technologies that they have left behind. I mean, Java is a great example of <clears throat> How much value that just technology has added over a period of time to all enterprises. Uh, great. Uh, great. Well, um, I mean, the, with the least latest things going on, how are you seeing sort of AI uh, play a pivotal role in shaping, expanding sort of open ecosystems? And, and what strategies do you believe are really most effective in harnessing AI's potential? 
to create meaningful connections and synergies within the tech industry. If you can talk about a little, um, a little yeah. about it. Right? Absolutely. <clears throat> if you think about, you know, the whole, up until now, we had this concept of open source, right? Now, open source, you know, it clearly defines what the open source definition looks like. You have the right to view the code, distribute the code, use the code any way you like. No restrictions. It needs to be an OSI compliant license. And that's the standard open source definition. With open AI, that definition is not clear because source is just one part of it. Um, what about your data? What about your weights? What about your model? What about your infrastructure? Um, even if you give me all that, can I reproduce that entire thing on myself? Because what if your model was trained on a bit of a private data? So I think all of that concept of what open AI means um, is very unclear. Now there is work going on, active work going on in o OSI, Open Source Institute, um, uh, OSI, where the work is going on and to define what that <clears throat> open and AI definition would mean like. There was a 0 .0 0.0.3 version of the draft that was announced a couple of weeks ago, which talks about that, okay, we're gonna, it's gonna be likely a spectrum that, you know, you could be open API, like the what open AI product is, or you could be Llama 2, which is like, here you go, everything is published out in a paper. You can create the way you want it. If you have the infrastructure, run for it. <clears throat> and then the other part of it is, that's one way to see it. The other way to see this is, there is tuning that, or there is a um, training that can happen. Now, creating a large foundation model is not easy. It requires a lot of hardware, a lot of resources, et cetera, et cetera. And that can be done only a handful of companies around the world because of the amount of infrastructure it requires. But then once you got that large foundation model, then on top of that, you can do fine tuning or you can do RAG on top of it based upon what architecture works for you to really cater and tap into the, unput the potential information that is hiding in your own uh, network inside the firewall. So you could bring something like OpenAI, do a RAG on top of it, put all the contextual information in the vector database and build that RAG pipeline that really opens up all those PDFs and JPEGs and all the email conversations that allows you to create the context. Now, <clears throat> where Intel contributes very heavily over here is, we believe in creating those fundamental blocks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. So. Mm -hmm. As people are creating those foundation models, PyTorch by default is sort of the largest, the largest used framework over there. So Intel joined the PyTorch Foundation uh, last year, actually earlier this year, as a governing board member. Uh, Intel is a top three contributor to the PyTorch framework. And the reason we contribute is because we believe that customers want to use PyTorch and we wanna make sure it is optimized for the latest Intel hardware. And so we continue to do that. And more recently, we took the ownership of the CPU module where we not only contributed our fixes and patches, but we enabled places so that other vendors who want to enable PyTorch for their CPU can contribute their patches. So that's a very classic example of chop wood carry water work, where we are trying to lift the entire industry along with us. And that's the reason, you know, we were accept one of the reasons why we were accepted to the PyTorch governing board seat. So I think open ecosystem is going to play a very significant role here. The other part that we also need to think about is sort of the ethical and the responsible part of it. Yep. And that's where you see, for example, there is a US AI Safety Institute that was launched a couple of weeks ago. That's where we see um, Bletchley Decla Declaration that just happened like, you know, a couple of weeks ago again. You know, all of these organizations, that's where we see the AI Act in Europe. So all of these definitions are coming along to really keep a good check on it. And the beauty here is it's a really good combination of federal government activities along in association with the private government, you know, the private in private sector. And so that and then, of course, academia. So if you three, see from those three different angles, all these three are moving at a very rapid pace. What is going to look, I mean, last year, um, around this time, if somebody would have asked, what is OpenAI going to be? Nobody would have guessed. Nobody have, nobody guessed it at all. 
So where it's going to be in a year from now, I think is anybody's guess. Um, but it's definitely an exciting ride. And open ecosystem has a really large role to play here. Yeah, uh, I, I thank you for sharing that. And I think, um, uh, you know, we keep thinking, I think uh, uh, what OpenAI has done is opened up sort of floodgates, but there's going to be tons and tons of open source LLM models that organizations will be able to use. And hopefully, because, uh, you know, uh, as you were saying, building foundational models is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, and having access to it is very important. So if you can democratize in a way right. that access, and then you customize on top of it, almost like the same open source uh, approach to exactly. it. Exactly. I think that will be fantastic. Uh, and we yeah. all will benefit from it. Yeah, like, I mean, we have 100 million plus Xeon instances um, available around the world across hyperscalers, network, edge, you name it, laptops. And the whole idea that is exactly the mission for uh, Intel is to bring AI everywhere. And um, if you see in terms of a pyramid, there are model creators, there are uh, tuners, rag people, and then there are inferencers. But the inferencing people are way large over there. And right. with our Intel GPU, with our Intel CPU at a wide range of places, that's exactly the place we wanna, where we want to democratize it. So that customers are not locked into a platform and they can say, yeah, I am going here. I have a choice and I, because of open ecosystem, I can actually participate in defining in what it needs to be, as opposed to relying upon the mercy of one vendor. Yeah. And I think it will benefit everybody too, right? Because this is one area where the more people contributing it to the better it becomes for everyone. And that's the whole diversity and the inclusion perspective, right? I remember, yeah. Uh, one of the stories uh, from my Apple days, long, long dated story, but the idea was that when um, I think the iPhone was to launch uh, a few weeks before that, they realized, oh, they have only they were supposed to launch the touch button and they realized we are only have people, right handed people testing the phone. It needs to be equally tested people with right handed and people who don't have all the fingers or thumb. How would that work? So that's the diversity and the inclusion aspect of it. That how yeah. do you how do you make it work for people who don't have hands? How would the touch work for them? So I think thinking from that perspective, if your mission is I want to launch iPhone and I want to make it accessible to everybody in the planet, what does that everybody look like? Is what you're going to define. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, as as we move forward, uh, I know we are towards the end of it, but I, there are a couple of things that I still want to quickly touch upon. Um, you most recently headed the TED AI Hackathon, and now you're working with also United Nations around AI for good. Um, can you share a little about the purposeful innovation being created and, and what inspired you to work on these projects? I think that to me is a very classic example of purpose-driven hackathon. Because really, if you think about United Nation has sustainable development goals, there are 17 of those. And the purpose is highly ambitious. No poverty, no hunger, no crime, racial justice, weather, climate, um, you name it. These are just beautiful, gender equality. So that's the purpose. And so um, when I was working with TED AI, we created this AI for good hackathon and again, the purpose was that, hey, pick one of those or more of those SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and leverage AI to create a solution towards solving that purpose. So it was very clear that I'm going to accept your application only if you are working towards that purpose. And then the solution, whatever it needs to be, then we will evaluate based upon its technicality alignment to the purpose. So that was very satisfying. We had what? Um, 130 plus participants, 36 plus teams uh, that had nonstop for 30 hours. We had um, lots of judges, uh, really good interaction, and just learning to people, learning and by talking with people was so humbling that what motivates them and every discussion was so, so inspiring over there. And now we are looking to take that forward. I've been working with United Nations for the last few months. And now we are partnering with them to create a bigger hackathon. So this community called as CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. 
I'm on the governing board and the chair of the governing board as well. So there I'm working to create a hackathon that could be shared where again, we will have people from UN come and participate, help us drive that hackathon. So they are providing the purpose, we are providing the technical background and align the two together. How do we make the world a better place? That is fantastic, very inspiring. Uh, I, I can I can see the passion in, in just Thank the you. way you're you are talking about it and describing it. Um, as we wrap up, uh, Arun, um, one of the things we have a lot of, as I said, aspiring leaders who are, who are uh, you know, early stages of their career, they're building the team. What one piece of advice would you give to these aspiring leaders who are building teams? I think one of the one of the most useful advice that I got in my career, which was very helpful, is to create that psychological safety in the team. And by that I mean is like this morning I was having a discussion and somebody was giving me an example. Oh, I was talking to this exec and this exec said. I can't give the bad news to the CEO. That's not the kind of psychological safety I'm talking about. I'm talking about the exact opposite. I'm talking about a place by which people feel encouraged to talk about the failures. People feel encouraged to talk about what's not right. And as a, so as a leader, you have a responsibility to creating that psychological safety in the team. If there are eight people in the team, make sure one or two people are not hogging the conversation. They're not filibustering the, the meeting. Very important element. Make sure you create space in the, for people who are a bit shy and some people take some time to gather their thoughts. So for example, in my meeting, I'll propose an idea and I'll call it out that, hey, I'm proposing it. It's a, just a brain dump. It's nothing big. I'm looking for your ideas because as a leader, sometimes you propose, oh that is already baked i'm just going to follow it along so <clears throat> excuse me i challenge them to challenge my idea that no this is just a brain dump challenge me back push me back how we can make it better how can we align it better and sometimes people are not able to say their thought in a meeting talk to them one-on-one -on -one. so that diversity and the inclusion perspective that if you have a mixed team of different gender make sure you create space and again, don't put them in spot. No, no, you must speak. Create a space that, okay, one of the ways I do this is uh, I tell people that, okay, last 10 minutes, everybody that you who has spoken so far stays quiet. People who have not spoken, I want to give them a chance to gather their thoughts. And I give them 15, 30 second break. Nobody says a word, let them gather their thought and then somebody speaks. Oh, okay. And that diversity is honestly something that I thrive upon. So that's as a leader, of the team and then going up your chain is important that if you find something wrong stand up for your team because you can't just say i'm going to create a psychological safety in my team but i'm not going to be safe going upward so i think is you become the conduit in that sense for your team and building that psychological <coughs> excuse me building that psychological safety messiah and when promoting it yeah, no, uh, very well said. I think that's that's a great, great uh, point uh, to make. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know I could continue and, and go on and on. I'm really enjoying it. Um, but I know there are lots of questions waiting waiting for you. So I don't want to keep them waiting. So with that, Bianca, um, if you want to just start uh, with the questions, I'm sure they will benefit all of us a lot. Absolutely. Thank you, Ashu and Arun. We are now going to open up the floor for our live Q&A session where you can ask our panelists any questions you may have. If you haven't already, please type your questions in the Q&A chat box found at the bottom toolbar. Our first question comes in from Josh. He asks, have you had a mentor in your life who has impacted you as a leader? And if so, could you please share a little bit about he or she? I can. Yeah. Um, so, it's funny how I came to Amazon, actually. Um, uh, I had, I, I reached out to this person by the name Adrian Cockcroft, um, and uh, I met him at a train station in Stockholm. Uh, we were going to Orlando Airport, and from there we were driving to the Stockholm Central, and at a 20 minute train ride, I'm sitting right next to him, and I've known Adrian for a very long time. 
I, I asked him up front, Adrian, would you be my mentor? Like, and here is where I am in my career and I don't know what I want to do and how do I grow from there? So he guided me He's like, yeah, let's look at this. Let's look at this option. How about this? And then um, a couple of months later, we had a lunch and then whatever he told me, I worked upon that. And then I remember that, gosh, this is 2016 uh, December. And that's when, you know, I am at Amazon reInvent. And by that time, Amazon, uh, sorry, Adrian has joined AWS. And I'm telling Adrian, what the heck are you doing? What are the wonderful things that Amazon is announcing? And why there is nobody looking at open ecosystem over there? And Adrian says, yep, I'm going to hire you for that role one day. And three months later, I think that was really the game changer in my career, I would say, where Adrian hired me at Amazon. And then from there onwards, it's been such a fun journey. I mean, it was fun before that also, but really joining Amazon and learning the cloud concepts and putting myself out there, it mm -hmm. allowed me to get rid of my fear of failures. And uh, in that sense, I'm very fearless. And um, as much as I, I'm purely a product of my failures here, honestly. Um, and that is the kind of psychological safety I create in my team as well. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, one word that comes to mind is curious. You have to be curious and asking those questions or saying, oh yeah, open source should be a part of AWS. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's being curious and asking those questions and then look what, look what happens. So. Yeah. I think that genuine curiosity is a fundamental concept of mindfulness, right? So, I mean, I practice mm -hmm. that on a regular basis. Um, somebody asks a question as opposed to judging them right away. It's like, why are you asking that question? I think, okay. What's the background? What's the concept? What yeah. are we trying to do here? And I keep my biases aside and I just focus on what are we, and there's a technique called as reflective listening, which is very radical. You know, and all I'm doing is I'm listening to your idea, I'm grasping it, I'm groking it, and I'm communi communicating back to you by paraphrasing it, because that really helps me understand your perspective. And with a genuine curiosity, you are able to explain the concept a lot better, and then you can have a more meaningful conversation. Very true. Right. Our next question comes in from Lucinda. She asks, can you share more about your work with children in education and technology? Yeah, um, <clears throat> gosh, about 11, 12 years ago, my elder son, who is a junior at UPenn now, uh, he came to me that, dad, um, my jar is broken. I said, what jar did you break? I said, oh, no, no, not that, not the water jar, but my Java jar. I said, what the heck? How do you know what a Java jar is? I said, oh, this game of Minecraft is written in Java, and I have a jar that I zip open, and I put some texture files in there. I said, you did what? And I was at Oracle that time as a Java evangelist, so my antennas straight away went up. So that Christmas, I remember, one of the best Christmas of my life, we uh, hacked Minecraft modding together. And I realized, hey, if he can, it can matter to him, if it can impact him, let's grow it. So um, later that year, we actually called a bunch of his friends over. We started teaching them Minecraft modding, giving them their first Minecraft lesson, how to make a bigger TNT explosion. And gosh, that was 11 years, 12 years ago. Changed my life. I founded a nonprofit called as DevOps for Kids. We have reached out to 5,000 kids around the world with that. <clears throat> my son and I wrote a book about that on Minecraft modding. Uh, my younger son is getting into it. He delivers these workshops called as Sonic Pi, uh, which is writing Ruby code and you learn music uh, with part of that. We have several board members who actively you know, deliver workshops. Uh, there was a girl that I mentored over there. Uh, she was one of our DevOps for Kids instructor and she ended up doing her uh, Girl Scout project, actually, a gold project, for, which is the highest rank in Girl Scout. She ended up doing her Girl Scout project as part of DevOps for Kids. So it's really fulfilling not to just get that fire in the kid about STEM, but also see them being successful, becoming massive public speakers. So one of my friend's daughter, she um, ended up, she was very afraid to give, you know, attend a workshop. She just casually used to hang out in the workshops. From there, she ended up becoming a speaker at Grace Hopper talking about DevOps for kids. 
So I, I, I feel really proud of that. That is amazing. I didn't know that. It really That's is. Amazing. <laughs> I don't know how you find all the time. <laughs> it's very impressive. It's a, yeah, yeah I mean, we, we all got 24 by 7. So I think... This is true. This is true. And this is where our next uh, question comes in from Sanjay. He says, you speak of mindfulness. Um, can you please share a little bit more about the balance between work and your personal life? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a stickler in terms of my work and personal life. You know, my work usually starts around eight o'clock, um, sometimes seven o'clock, but usually around eight o'clock, um, but usually wraps up around five, five thirty, because that's the time that uh, my son wants to be with me. Uh, he's a um, sophomore in high school right now, but I want to spend time with him. Um, we would uh, do the cooking together. We'll go for grocery shopping together. Um, I usually take responsibility for dinner in the night. I want to make sure I take care of that. And I think if nine hours are you working very clearly, very crisply, it gets tiring. Um, I make sure that I take time for myself. See, I mean, I think the important part you need to remember is you need to take care of yourself before you take care of others. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll have a serious burnout. And that's sort of the biggest thing that I've seen as much as I respect my own time. Um, I've given this card blanche to everybody in my team that folks, I might take time off during the regular weekday, but if I send a mail on weekend, I'm not expecting a response from you. I'm expecting a response only Monday morning, you are working time. So kind of creating that psychological safety and creating that space for yourself. And a lot of the mindfulness, as we talked about briefly, is also about that genuine curiosity, right? In any discussion, I am not trying to put my opinion, my judgment, my label in any shape and form. I'm always curious to learn. And then once I've understood your concept is when I'm going to say, okay, here is how I think it's okay to disagree. So I think applying a bit of a mindfulness, one of the, um, this morning, um, I was yesterday, actually, yesterday morning in my running, I was listening to a podcast. And they were talking about uh, Dr. Huberman, Bill Huberman is a scientist at Stanford. And I was listening to his po podcast. And he was talking about a psychological sigh. Anytime you are in a stress, he says, take a deep breath, full deep breath, and then take a sigh, very short sigh, and then let go. And he's saying what happens is, when you take a full deep breath, you got full oxygen in your body. And with that last basic sigh, you have completely loaded yourself with oxygen and then you let go. So instead of saying, calm down, which is going to irritate the other person and more, just say, let's breathe together. And mm -hmm. I think things like that really helps go a long way. Yeah, it's, it's uh, very interesting. Um, one of the things uh, Arun, I've been trying to do, not always successful, but um, anytime I'm sending emails out late at night or uh, and that are not critical, I would just save them in my drafts folder mm. and I send them Monday morning, eight o'clock. I'll just sync. Everything goes out at that time. Um, it's not always successful, but, but I try and do that as much as I can, especially knowing the people who will respond to it right away when I send it out. Right. Right. And I think that's the downside of being at a certain position. Sometimes I do that, you know, uh, Outlook is an okay tool for email, but one of the things I love about Outlook is a uh, schedule send. So yep. that's what I will use. That's what I use quite heavily now. Um, and to your point, same thing, you know, uh, not my team, but other peers started telling me like, oh, Varun, you send a mail, they feel pressure to respond back. Like, oh, boss has sent a mail. So I think I've started using that more actively. I, yeah. Schedule send Monday, eight o'clock. Yeah, and it works well. That's what I end up doing too. Or just put it in my drafts and I, I complete those thoughts and send them on Monday. Right. Right. We have one last question. It comes from Oded. He asks, when you look back at the trajectory of your career, what is one piece of advice you'd share to a student about venturing into the world of technology? One thing that I would strongly recommend is um, get rid of the imposter syndrome. I think that's the biggest one that I see for people early in their career. Um, my son did his internship at Roblox last year. And uh, he was saying that, hey, dad, this is my first time doing an internship. Um, and these people are very talented. 
they have 15, 20, 30 years of experience. I don't know how I'm going to ask questions to them. <coughs> Excuse me. And then one day he came to me that really struck a chord with me. And he says, <clears throat> these people are not perfect and I'm not fully flawed. So if I have to learn, I have to ask questions. And that just struck the chord with me. And I've used that statement multiple times in my mindfulness and kindness presentation. So just be kind to yourself, get rid of the imposter syndrome, get rid of the fear of your failures. You know, there is no failure that you cannot recover from. Humans are meant to be resilient. Just get rid of the fear of failures and you'll see wonderful things coming out your way. Very well said, uh, Arun. Fantastic. Okay, now we're going into our lightning round. We just have a few questions, little fun questions. I won't name one item on your bucket list. Oh, name um, Kilimanjaro hike, actually. Ah, okay. Coffee or tea? Neither. I don't drink caffeine. Wow. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, I would like to be able to look into people's eyes and make them a more kind person. Oh, dogs or cats? Um, I don't have pets and I don't like pets. I have one pet, which is gecko, which is sitting in a terrarium. That's my son's pet though. Okay, mountains or sea? Mountains, any day. Okay, and if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? I think one of the persons that I've respected in my life is Mahatma Gandhi. And my mom uh, has worked with him. You know, she has seen him in person and she tells me that the energy, the influence that he brings from his eyes is just terrific. And the way he changed the landscape of Indian geography, politics, the world, the influence that he carries on the world is just marvelous. I think I would love to spend a date or a dinner or whatever with him to just be with him. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your questions. On behalf of Windwire, I'd like to extend my gratitude to both Arun and Ashu for a wonderful session. Today's event will be available for on-demand access by going to windwire.com. If you want to stay on top of the latest news, technology solutions, and events, please follow us on our LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook pages for up-to-date information. Thanks again, and see you next time.